Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me here for tonight's event. My name is Rui Costa, and I'm the director and CEO of the Zuckerman Mind, Brain, and Behavior Institute. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here at this Stavros Niarchos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture. At the Zuckerman Institute, we are committed not only to understand how the brain works, but also to disseminate and, and, and bring to the public the latest findings in an accessible but engaging uh, language. So we hope that tonight's presentation on the science and the real life applications of brain machine interfaces sparks in you this uh, uh, curiosity, the same that we have when we study um, the brain. We'd like to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation and, and many foundation members that join us uh, here tonight for their continued partnership and commitment to helping us make this uh, science accessible. Tonight, you'll be treated to two individual presentations from two incredible speakers, uh, but these will be moderated by an amazing young scientist from the Zuckerman Institute, Dr. Karen Schroeder. Uh, Karen uh, did her uh, bachelor's in biomedical engineering and neuroscience at Duke University, and then she went to uh, um, University of Michigan, where she did a PhD in biomedical engineering, and then she joined the Zuckerman uh, Mind, Brain and Behavior Institute, where she's a postdoctoral researcher in Mark Churchill's lab. So her own work focuses on the development of brain computer interfaces for movement planning and control with the hopes that one day even people that are unable to move can do so just with neural activity, with, with, with a thought. Um, so she studies uh, the statistical structure of the activity in the cortex, especially the motor cortex that's responsible for our movements. And then using those statistics, she builds uh, brain machine interfaces, neural interfaces with much higher performance and reliability across a broad of, uh, of movement types. She's also very involved with the community. She's the co-organizer of Neural Launchpad and online talk series for, uh, for graduate students and postdocs in, in neuroscience. And um, she uh, has one of these amazing grants from the Brain Initiative that will lead her to her, uh, her own path. And so we hope that very soon uh, she's going to start her own laboratory uh, at a, another university or close by, who knows. So um, I hope you have a lot of questions during today's session. Thank you for those that sent some uh, questions in advance, but please engage and put your questions that come um, uh, during the talk in your Q and in the Q&A box. So now I'd like to turn it over to Karen to help uh, welcome Karen uh, uh, here, and she's going to uh, leave the whole session. Karen, thank you so much for doing this, and please take it away. Of course, thank you so much, Rui, for the introduction. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this virtual event. So I'll say a little bit about brain machine interfaces. Uh, brain machine interfaces or brain computer interfaces are electronic devices that provide a direct connection between the human brain and the external world. Brain computer interfaces hold this huge promise to improve life for people with sensory or movement impairments, and maybe for more of us in the general population in the future. And to me, they're also one of the most fascinating frontiers in science because they represent entirely new ways, new modalities for people to interact with the world. As Rui mentioned, I am a, currently a researcher at Columbia in this field. I'm working on my own small sort of part of this pursuit, which is BCIs to restore movement. And I became interested in BCIs as a student in high school and then in college. 
And over the years, it's been really amazing uh, for me to see the field developing and capturing the interest and imagination of the public more and more. So I'm really happy that we're here together today and about to hear from our speakers uh, about two sides of brain computer interfaces. So one side is what's the science behind them? What's the state of the art? And the other side, how do they affect those who use them? And after we hear from our two speakers, we're gonna chat about, chat a bit about uh, what's next for BCIs. So today we'll be hearing from Dr. Nima Mesgarani and Nathan Copeland. These are two experts who have very different experiences uh, in the world of BCIs. Nima Mesgarani's research focuses on understanding how the brain processes what we hear and using that knowledge to engineer brain-controlled hearing devices. Nathan Copeland's experience is as a pioneering research study participant who has been a part of BCI studies through the University of Pittsburgh in human clinical trials for the past six years. And he knows firsthand the challenges and also the promises of these devices. So we're going to hear two 15 minute talks, one from each speaker, and then I'll moderate a discussion where we'll take questions from you, uh, people in our audience. Thank you if you've already submitted a question, um, but if you haven't, please do, while the talks are in progress, you can use the Q&A button to submit a question and let us know if you are a teacher or student also. And if you are a student, uh, please tell us what grade you're in. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nima Mesgarani. He's an associate professor at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland and was a postdoc at the Center for Language and Speech Processing at Johns Hopkins University and the Neurosurgery Department at University of California, San Francisco. And he received the NSF Early Career Award in 2015, Pew Scholar for Innovative Biomedical Research Award in 2016, and the Auditory Neuroscience Young Investigator Award in 2019. His research has been selected among the top 10 innovations of the year by UNICEF, top 10 breakthroughs by Institute of Physics, and top 10 health innovations by Healthcare Innovation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nima Mesgarani to the stage. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides. All right, is everything okay with the slides? Yes. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Karen. I'm very excited to uh, to have this opportunity to tell you uh, all a little bit about the state of uh, brain computer interfaces uh, and more specifically about some of the work that we do in our group. Um, so as uh, Karen mentioned, uh, brain computer interfaces um, are you know, built on this notion that anything that we think, feel, sense, or do is, you know, basically boils down to activity of the neurons in our brain. Uh, so, so the, you know, so then is it, uh, is it possible to directly tap into that activity and read that information directly from the brain or write in new information into the brain? Um, and this sort of technology, this sort of, uh, you know, methods can be used to, uh, to, for example, replace a function, restore, enhance, supplement, or improve. Uh, so this is an area that has been very active and in the past uh, decade almost uh, has gone through uh, some really, uh, you know, breakthrough uh, uh, advances. And um, I'm going to start by just giving you a, feel, uh, a sense of uh, how, where this field is now and what are some of the new things that has happened, uh, particularly in the past decade. Um, so one of the first things is the control of a prosthetic arm. And that is something that we're going to hear in the second part of today, tonight from uh, Nathan. Um, so, you know, so this has been, uh, you know, one area of research that has received a lot of attention. Here you see, you know, a patient uh, that was um, uh, implanted on both sides and is able to control two robotic arms simultaneously to perform some complex tasks. Uh, this could be done also non-invasively, for example, from a bracelet that records uh, the, the activity in the muscles. Uh, for example, for someone for an amputee, and as you can tell here, you know, after some practice, uh, it's possible, you know, for these people learn how to control uh, uh, the robotic arms uh, 
really well. Um, it can be, you know, used to, uh, to, for example, control virtual objects. Um, and in one of the earlier work uh, uh, that uh, was a breakthrough in this field, uh, you know, people have used, uh, uh, you know, uh, electrical uh, activity, neuron, neural recordings in the brain of a monkey uh, to not only control an avatar, but also fill virtual objects in that virtual world. And I'm sure many of you have seen uh, uh, you know, this recent uh, video from the Neuralink. Uh, so this is the company that uh, Elon Musk started in uh, 2017. Uh, that you know what you see here is a monkey that is able to play video games. Um, and you know, and what is really interesting in this case is that you know, unlike the previous cases, there are no cables, there is no device. Everything is now integrated. Uh, this sort of, uh, you know, reading information from the activity of the muscles, the electrical activity in the muscles can also be used uh, using a, a wristband, like what you see here, to control virtual objects. Uh, so this is an example from a company called Control Lab that is now part of Facebook, uh, which is now Meta. Uh, and, you know, and you can imagine that this sort of technology can be soon used to control objects in a virtual reality uh, space. Now, so this is not only to, uh, to control, uh, let's say, an, a movement on an arm, but it can also be used for, you know, for example, messaging and surfing, uh, surfing the web. Uh, so what you see here is our two uh, people uh, who, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, who are able to use this sort of uh, devices and this sort of decodings to, to you know, send messages, you know, surf the web. Um, another recent advance has come from um, trying to decode um, letters, right? So, so as you, you know, imagine writing the letter from the activity of the neurons in the motor cortex, it is possible to decode uh, what the intended letter was. And what was remarkable about this uh, work that just you know, came out very recently is really the speed, which is 90 characters per minute. Uh, and, you know, if you want to have a sense, uh, Stephen Hawking was able to write one or two words per minute with, uh, you know, with the device that he was using. Uh, and the speed that the person types on a cell phone is around 180. So this is already half of that, which is really great. Uh, here is another example where researchers, uh, instead of looking at the hand activity, hand uh, motor cortex, they try to, to decode words directly from the speech cortex. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so this is the person also that is trying to, you know, uh, to, to try to say something and then from the activity in the, in the speech cortex, it's able, they're, they're able to decode uh, some of the words. All right, so this sort of uh, brain computer interfaces can also be used to uh, restore sensory functions. One of them, it, which is, you know, which has been around for a while now is a visual uh, prosthesis. Uh, that you know you can have a camera that sends information either to the retina or directly to the motor cortex and can um, uh, restore uh, 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 you know function to a person who is unable to see. Uh, cochlear implants are probably the most widely used BCI applications that can uh, stimulate the neurons in the cochlea directly for somebody who has lost uh, uh, hair cells. And using uh, that kind of method, they can restore also hearing to somebody who is unable to, uh, to hear. And finally, uh, one example that I want to mention, which is actually not very new, it's, it's pretty old, but this was a, uh, I think this was one of the first examples of direct brain-to-brain brain -brain, uh, interface. Uh, so what you see here, these two mice, uh, one of them is seeing a visual cue and the other one is pressing a lever. Uh, and the one that is pressing the lever doesn't see the visual cue. The one that sees the visual cue doesn't have access to the lever. But when their brains are synced, they are able to, you know, to solve this problem together and both of them are getting uh, food. Um, so, so this is nice, you know, and uh, if you want to you know, think of the uh, possible futuristic uh, applications of this sort of brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, uh, maybe one day instead of sending, sending a text to someone, you can send them a talk directly. All right, so now let's talk a little bit uh, more specifically about what we do in our group, uh, which is specifically about speech. So speech uh, uh, communication involves, uh, you know, uh, when, whenever we have something that we want to tell to another person, we have, uh, you know, we produce a pattern of electrical activity that then moves uh, the muscles in our vocal tract. And that uh, movement produces a, a vibration in the air. 
that when it travels and reaches uh, a person's eardrum, it causes a vibration of the eardrum. And that uh, movement is then translated to uh, electrical activity and is interpreted by their brain. And they suddenly know what uh, you wanted to tell, who you are, how you're feeling. All of that information can be directly uh, uh, estimated from the sound. Now, this obviously is, um, you know, could be effortless for many people, but a lot of people are suffering from um, having a disabling hearing loss. Uh, the chart that you see here shows um, uh, the projected number of people with hearing uh, disabling hearing loss. And as you can tell, uh, pretty soon it's going to reach a billion. And even now, one in eight people um, in US have hearing loss, and that raises to 50%. So one in two in uh, those who are 75 and older. So this is a problem that is you know, going to affect a lot of people, and uh, that's why we are focused on this problem. All right, so here is a very quick summary of uh, you know, what goes on in the brain in the, in the, as we listen to speech. These are the parts of the brain that are involved. From the ear, you have the cochlear that does time frequency analysis. And from there, the signal travels through multiple stops until it reaches the auditory cortex, uh, which is this area right behind your ear. And from there, there are some other places that are involved. We know, especially because of uh, you know, people who have uh, lost function in some of their brain and from the kind of deficits that they have, uh, you know, uh, we, we know something about what sort of uh, areas are involved. Um, exactly how it's, uh, it's un more unclear. We don't know that as much yet. All right, so if you wanna study the system, obviously we have to have a way to, to, to record from these areas. Uh, and the methods that we use in our lab, uh, one of them is um, uh, invasive recordings. So these are, uh, done in collaboration with the hospitals here at Columbia and other places in New York. And, uh, you know, these are the patients that are undergoing um, epilepsy surgery. And as part of their clinical care, they are implanted with these sort of uh, invasive electrodes, uh, which are placed in order to, to figure out the locus of the epilepsy. But while they are in the hospital and they're connected to a computer, we can go and ask them to participate in our um, projects and we can then record uh, from their uh, brain and with these two um, methods, the surface electrodes, uh, ECOG, and with these sort of depth electrodes, we are able to access uh, both the primary parts and the secondary parts of the auditory cortex. So let's see what kind of, uh, what kind of activity do we expect to see as a person is listening to, to speech. So here is one case. And what you see here is, um, each of those dots is, uh, represents one electrode. And what you see here, the color change is the, the change in the voltage as the person is uh, listening to speech. So there is clearly, there's a lot of information there. Um, and you know, one of the scientific goals that we and many other are pursuing is to um, basically figure out what in the signal, you know, what kind of sounds when are heard are causing this sort of pattern. You know, wh why do we have this sort of spatial temporal pattern of activity in the brain? And you know, when we talk about the speech communication, what you might uh, consider is something like this, like you're sitting in a nice quiet place, having a conversation with a friend. Uh, but obviously, uh, especially for those of us who live in New York, that is really not the case. And this is more of the scenario that we are faced with every day. So as you're having a conversation with a friend, cars are passing by, uh, you have maybe planes, other people who are around you are, are speaking at the same time. And, uh, you know, especially in New York, this is a big problem, right? If you look at the, the noise map in New York City, uh, you can easily see that there is pretty much nowhere that you can find to have a quiet conversation with someone. So we constantly are, uh, you know, surrounded by all these sort of sounds, all these sort of uh, irrelevant noises that we have to filter out. And in our uh, scientific work, one of the things that we have shown is that, um, our brain is able to adapt very quickly whenever the noise changes. So if you're talking to a friend, you're walking from the street to a bar, for example, uh, or a restaurant, as soon as the background changes, it's going to come in and flood your system. And then very quickly you adapt to it and then you go back to as if it wasn't even present. Um, you know, for many of us, it's, uh, it's a simple thing, but if, uh, you know, for anybody who has a hearing loss, this is already a difficult problem. 
So one of the, the, the goals that we have is to figure out if there is a way to, to enhance hearing, particularly in background noise. And uh, I wanted to tell you about one, one case that we had a patient with this sort of a depth electrodes. And surprisingly, we, we discovered that whenever we are stimulating, we are sending electricity to the electrodes that are in a particular part of the brain called the planum temporale. Uh, this patient re re uh, uh, you know, uh, responded that the background noise disappears and all I hear is the voices. Um, and I wanted you to hear that from, his, uh, from her own mouth. Let me just play this video. Okay, now I'm gonna to count to 10. <coughs> One, two, and just tell me when you feel a change and what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, four. seven, oh, eight. Nine. Five, oh, it's getting stronger. What would you feel? I can hear your voice more and more clear. You, you, you use some other description. I, she's NPO right now, so I don't want you to talk too much because I don't want your mouth to get too dry, but uh, you described it. What, what's the best way you can describe this in 10 words or less? When you're listening to music and you're trying to adjust the equalizer, the tone, how you hear the music, easiest way to explain it. Would you describe it? Yeah, so, uh, and, you know, and this was, uh, uh, you know, something that we also systematically tested. So we gave her a lot of uh, speech and noise materials, and I asked her to, to report uh, the quality and also the intelligibility by repeating them with and without the simulation. And we confirmed that it was significantly improved. Like the intelligibility goes from 50% uh, when she was able to hear half of the words to almost 100%. So, so this is a, a really interesting, and um, you know, and if you remember the picture that I showed you, this sort of neural activity as we are listening to sound and, and speech. Uh, one question that you might ask, which then connects this to the whole world of brain-computer interfaces, is how much can we say by looking at this activity about what the person actually heard or wanted to hear? And um, you know, like, is it, for example, possible to do a decoding and map it back to the sound that the person heard? And you know, if that works, it could be, of course, useful for people who uh, are unable to speak, if we can decode their speech directly from their brain. And it also could have uh, applications for uh, people who use hearing aids. Uh, you know, one of the problems with the hearing aids currently is that uh, you know, anybody who has them doesn't really use them when they really need them. Because if they go to a crowded place, they amplify everybody, and that doesn't really help the person. So to look at the first problem, how much can we say about what the person heard without knowing what they heard? Um, you know, the easiest thing you can do is to record the neural activity and then find some kind of a relationship between the neural activity and the sound. And if you have a model of that relationship, then we can reconstruct a sound for a new sample. And uh, let me play you an example of what is possible, which was, uh, you know, the first one is based on, you know, a work that I did when I was a graduate student almost a decade ago, more than a decade ago. It probably wasn't very intelligible. And now, you know, with our recent work, when we use more advanced models, this is what we get. So, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I hope you could tell that this was this were the digits and it's much more intelligible now. And you know, one question that you might ask is, but what if you have multiple people talking? And if you reconstruct from someone's head, someone's uh, neural activity, do you see both of the talkers or do you only see the person that you're attending to, you're, you're focusing on? And if you change your focus, is that going to change? And that's exactly the question that we investigated uh, in a scientific study that, um, you know, we had uh, um, people listening to, to, to talkers alone and we get, you know, we reconstruct these images from their brain. And when they are listening to the mixture, mixed audio, but attending to one at the same time, we only see that talker as if the other speaker is filtered. Now, this could be uh, interesting, right? Like imagine that you might be in a party and maybe you are paying attention to one person and this uh, research shows that your brain waves are going up and down, are following with the voice of that person. But if you suddenly start to, to listen to another conversation, uh, then your brain waves are going to switch and then follow the voice of that other talker. And you know, and if, you, if a person has a hearing aid in an environment like this, that is not going to be useful, right? 
because uh, there is nothing that the hearing aid can do on the, uh, you know, other than amplifying everybody without knowing which person you want to listen to and which people you want to eliminate. So that's exactly the idea of this sort of brain control hearing device, that you have a system that automatically separates all the sounds, compares them to the brain, and then chooses the one that is most similar to, to the brain wave. And by amplifying that person, then it can help the person to, to, to hear. Now, you know, you might think that the brain part is a very difficult part of this issue, but it turns out that solving that engineering problem is also extremely difficult. And that is an area that we focused um, a lot in the past uh, few years, and we've been able to solve this problem by finding better representations of audio that have uh, separation of the talkers. Now, um, you know, having that, then we can have uh, this sort of idea that you have, uh, a, imagine a box that we call it AAD, auditory attention decoder, which has two inputs. One of them is the sound in the environment, and the other one is the brainwave of a listener. And inside of this box, it automatically separates the voices, compares them to the brain, and amplifies the one that is most similar to the brainwave of a listener. And um, I'm going to show you a demo of this system. Um, this is a system that the first part, uh, the listener is trying to focus on the male talker, and that switches to the female. And we turn on the system at, at 10 seconds, and the switch happens around 25. How, How to, to be a shepherd. Dogs Being a shepherd can be a lot of fun, of people. especially when you know how you to do it. Thought about having your own Shepherds companion? can be found all over the world. If you do not world. have a dog yet, Any place you need from to understand the, the difference Israel between breeds before making a choice. The breed of a dog can have significant impact on its personality, like as well as its size, if you want health, to do this, and required maintenance. To move to Wales or For example, long-haired breeds, in the United like States, collies, Move Maybe to Idaho or Wyoming. Buy a sheepdog. If you do not have time Some sheepdogs are better than others. You would do you best to look on a dog market breeds. online or see the if you American can find Eskimo a breeder. All right, yeah, so I hope uh, you could uh, tell that it was much easier to listen to the attended talker when the other person is attenuated. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, so basically, let me just wrap up by, uh, you know, that sort of uh, brain control interface uh, technologies. Um, um, are already around. They are used to repair, restore, and enhance sensory, motor, and cognitive function. And this sort of brain control hearing devices, they are potentially able to, to edit the acoustic scene for you, right? So they can eliminate the sources of sound that you don't want and just keep the ones that you want to listen to, which could be extremely useful in noise. Uh, and uh, I wanna just emphasize that this sort of research really requires a multidisciplinary approach, which combines the neuroscience, engineering, and computing sciences uh, which is really the essence of uh, uh, the Zuckerman Institute and uh, you know, the institute that uh, hosts us. And I just want to acknowledge uh, all the lab members and our funding sources, and I'll be happy to take questions in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nima. Uh, remember, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A button to submit it and we'll answer them after the second talk. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Nathan Copeland. In 2004, Nathan was just 18 years old when a serious car accident left him with quadriplegia. The lack of mobility caused by this made life more difficult and often left him feeling like he would no longer be able to accomplish much with his life. But years later, he was presented with the opportunity to help shape future technologies that could eventually benefit people in similar situations. When he learned that this opportunity involved being a participant in a research study, he knew he couldn't refuse. And for the last six years, Nathan has participated in a BCI study through the University of Pittsburgh. Using microelectrode arrays implanted in his motor cortex, he's able to control a robotic arm. Additionally, Nathan was the first human implanted with microelectrode arrays in somatosensory cortex, which can be stimulated to provide sensation back from the robotic arm. While his time with the research study is finite, Nathan has built up a wealth of experience that will stick with him for the rest of his life, from meeting President Barack Obama to giving presentations in Japan. And he hopes to continue sharing the story and insights into using implanted BCI with the world. Please join me in welcoming Nathan Copeland to the stage. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, like mentioned, my name is Nathan Copeland, and in 2004, I was in a car accident that left me a C5 quadriplegic. 
uh, while I was in the rehab hospital, they asked if I wanted to be um, listed on a research registry where doctors could um, find participants that qualified for the studies they were looking uh, uh, to do. And, you know, I, I thought, you know, you never know what's gonna come up in the future. So I said, yeah, and, you know, I, I kind of forgot about it for, for a few years. And uh, it's, it's been around seven years now that I got involved with uh, BCI study at the University of Pittsburgh, where I have I have four BlackRock Utah microelectrode arrays implanted on on my brain. Uh, they are a ten by ten grid of these little spikes. Each spike is uh, you know an electrode that's able to record. A single neuron, and that's kind of what what they look like. Uh, little squiggles, if you've never seen them. And then, so I have two of those in motor cortex uh, that allow me to control things like a robotic arm and computer cursor. And I am also the first human in the world to have. Implants in sensory cortex, where um, using intracortical microstimulation, they can kind of, you know, just send a little bit of uh, stimulation directly uh, into my brain that will elicit a sensation that feels like it's coming from my own hand. Um, recording from all these neurons uh, allows the computer to. Uh, make a, a decoder that basically, you know, I, I think a direction while the computer's uh, showing me a visual of a hand going in that direction. And I just kind of think along with it and it makes a decoder that uh, basically figures out my intentions. And then this kind of control is uh, what we were able, well, are able to accomplish. But one of the, the biggest questions that I always get asked is, uh, where do I feel sensations and what do they feel like? And before I actually started the study, I'd been told by more than a few researchers that they were really looking forward to what I had to say since, you know, only monkeys had had this kind of stuff uh, implanted before and they're not very good at uh, talking or, or uh, letting me know these things. So this picture is a, a representation of uh, where the sensory electrodes are implanted um, in relation to the central sulcus, sulcus brain and then each of these colored squares is one of the electrodes and on the hand is a corresponding area that I feel a sensation when they stimulate on that electrode and uh, so you see uh, most of the sensations I feel are at the base of my fingers and then I do get some that are my index knuckle. And then the, the real can of worm questions is what does it feel like? Um, so the sensations that I feel, um, that they do feel like they're coming from my own hand and they don't feel uh, completely uh, natural, like they don't have a a one to one real world uh, analog that I can compare them to, but uh, usually it's it's a pressure or tingle. Um, there's some that feel warm. Uh, some feel like 
uh, tapping. Um, and uh, so where on my hand, the sensation feels like is electrode dependent, but by changing some of the simulation parameters, uh, like uh, changing from 100 hertz to 20 hertz, uh, can change the sensation that I feel. Um, and then, uh, so, Hooking uh, this stimulation up to uh, the robotic hand um, completes a bi-directional computer interface where uh, sensors on the hand, uh, in this case, we use torque sensors in the fingers, uh, let the computer know that the hand has made contact with an object and then the, uh, depending on the values of those torque sensors, uh, the computer will send stimulation to an electrode that we'd already determined felt like the corresponding finger that was being touched on the robotic hand. And uh, that basically let me feel like um, I was touching the object. And, and like I said uh, before, while those sensations weren't completely um, comparable to a real world uh, sensation, like if I, a ball, it didn't uh, really feel exactly the same, um, but just getting any feedback uh, to go along with my uh, visual feedback um, we found really helped improve my performance of tasks where I was picking an object up and placing it on um, a box. And basically, the this is a video showing the fastest time that I completed these objects uh, with and without uh, stimulation. And basically, when when I don't have stimulation, I look at the object and I see that the hand is made contact with it. But sometimes I would go to pick it up, and it would fall out or, you know, I, I just I didn't have that reassurance that the hand was making a good grasp on the object. And so I would spend extra time trying to uh, make sure that I had that um, good contact. And then with feedback, uh, along, with the, along with the visual feedback, the sensory feedback allowed me to just um, realize and have that assurance that I was making good contact with the object. And then I just uh, moved on to uh, picking it up and putting it on the box. And then in 2016, um, the White House Frontiers Conference was in Pittsburgh, and I went into the lab uh, one day. I, I usually go uh, three days a week for uh, about four hours for testing. But I, I just went in on this random day, and they asked if I wanted to meet the president. And I said, yeah, like I, I couldn't imagine why, why I would say no. And so a few months later, uh, I got to meet President Obama and shake his hand with a robot and uh, fist bump it. And for a long time, I thought that was the thing I ever got to do uh, with the robotic arm for study, but then. In 2018, I got to fulfill my life stream of going to Japan. Um, everyone knew I really wanted to do that. I've always been into anime and, and sci-fi, and that's actually, you know, one of the reasons 
so interested in uh, the BCI study. Um, I just thought it was, you know, really cool. And uh, there was a conference in Japan and I got to use it as a, basically an excuse to get to go to Japan for two weeks. And uh, I did a presentation there and I did a presentation at a couple universities and um, that has now been the coolest thing I've ever done involving um, BCI. One of the things I wanted to do since the beginning was play video games with BCI. It was something I was always interested in uh, before my accident and after five years of asking, I, I was finally able to play Final Fantasy XIV uh, with my implants and we made a video of it. And, you know, last time I checked, there was like 230,000 views or something of this on my, my YouTube channel uh, that I put it on. And I, I wasn't that great at playing with it, but it was just uh, pretty awesome to get to play it and... Hello everyone, sorry we're having a, a moment of technical difficulty. We're gonna try to get Nathan back here. In the meantime, I see a lot of very nice questions coming in through the chat box. So thank you for those. We'll be right back. So while we are waiting for uh, Nathan's internet problem to be fixed, I'd like to invite Nima back on stage with me and we can take some of the questions from the audience that were directed to him. Hello. Hello. All right, we have a lot of interesting questions. So the first one uh, that I wanted to ask you was, what inspired you to start your research? How did you get started in this field? Oh, um, yeah, well, I, you know, I've always been interested in uh, speech and audio, um, and I think it might, you know, go back to my grandparents who had uh, hearing impairment. So I was always interested in this problem. And I started as a, just a pure hardcore engineer, and I was just working on speech technologies, uh, things like Siri, uh, Google Voice. Uh, but, you know, back in the days when I was a graduate student, these technologies were horrible. Like, nobody was... Uh, using them, they didn't really exist. And, you know, and everybody who was working on them was really frustrated because, uh, you know, nothing was working. And then we had this wonderful example, the brain that was doing a great job. Um, so that inspired me also to move a little bit towards the brain and learn about uh, the brain and to see if there are ideas that we can use to, to make these technologies better. Um, and that's how, you know, I've been going back and forth and now I have a mixed sort of, uh, uh, you know, training in both neuroscience and engineering of audio, and um, it's been a really uh, rewarding journey. So another question, oh, we have Nathan back. <laughs> so this was uh, probably the most bad luck I've, I've had in a while. I actually, I just found, went uh, to the doctors today and I have a, broken leg and then now this happens my desktop computer crashes twice uh, in a row and now I am on my laptop let's see if I can share my screen and try and continue so sorry to hear about your leg Appreciate your your swift laptop action. There. Yes, that happens. I don't need surgery or anything, so that's good news. I just have to wear a brace for a while. Okay, can you guys see this again? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I got to play a video game. <laughs> that was uh, pretty cool. 
Okay, so my implant, the server implant was actually done on May 3rd, Star Wars Day, so a few years ago. I just came in that day and uh, someone had brought lightsabers. I still am not clear who, who that was, but uh, we just decided that this was probably the best uh, way to celebrate. Uh, I also really like this video um, because the arm that I'm using in this video is the, actually the second robotic arm I've gone to use, and that's the Luke arm by DECA. The, the black one from before was the modular prosthetic limb made by APL. Um, let's see. This is uh, just showing some control using that arm. Uh, this is one of the objects in that same uh, air at test that I showed before. This is actually the hardest thing. Um, the, those marbles are meant to represent water and, uh, you know, water and robots, you know, dumping and splashing all over the place is not the best idea. So we, we went with marbles. And so besides those two arms, I've actually, uh, probably, I, I think I have a, a good, a good chance that I can say no one has controlled more things uh, using a BCI than I have. Uh, uh, the top left here is a, a, a bare arm. Uh, I've used a Princilia hand. I've asked, I, uh, got to use a Glory Ha exoskeleton glove. Uh, I used that for a while and I got to eat a a taco with that. Um, now, currently, I'm using the KUKA LBR assembly robot. Um, this picture has uh, the right hand robotics reflex tactile gripper, but just recently I've gotten to use a, a different hand on it uh, that is an anatomical hand. Um, this is actually my favorite robot that I've been able to control. Um, specifically because it is not anatomical. Um, all the extra joints allow it to work within the workspace a lot easier with uh, limitations like, uh, like the other arms that are mounted at the shoulder do just because, uh, you know, it's, it's being an actual arm, it's, it's limited in the a direct and way that it can move with the workspace. Th this picture is all of the the stuff that is required to run uh, these BCIs, and it's just one of the big reasons that you know not everyone just has these at their house anymore. Like you know, there's a whole rack of computers and specialized equipment. And then there's even more, more specific equipment for doing the micro stimulation. And it's just, it's just a lot of stuff and you need, you know, people to, to run it all. And then a few years ago, I started using this portable um, tablet version uh, that basically condenses all that other stuff into a box and a, a medical grade tablet. It uses these um, Cereplex E's, which are now Neuroplex, instead of the, the big patient cables, uh, those just screw onto the pedestals. And you can use a regular, it's a micro HDMI cable. And uh, while the, the tablet is, I'm usually generous when I just say not, not powerful. Um, it, it's really limited, uh, you know, CPU wise and, and that kind of stuff of what it can do. 
but basically I, I can use it to control, you know, to make a cursor decoder that I can use to either um, emulate a mouse or, or keyboard presses, which, you know, uh, at home lets me do things like play video games, um, which I, you know, really like, really like doing. Uh, I have some of these on my YouTube channel and one day I hope to, you know, put some more out and maybe stream playing or, you know, just someone somehow gets me a PS5, maybe control one of those with my brain. But, um, so the tablet can actually connect over the network to my uh, desktop computer, which right now is not doing too well. Um, but then that allows me to control the cursor and keyboard on that computer, which can run much more um, demanding games and, and programs. Um, so the other thing I really like to do uh, with this system at home is draw um, using you know basic uh, painting programs. This is of course my favorite meal at Taco Bell: uh, cheesy gordita crunch and a Baja Blast. Um, and then just here's some of my other art that I've drawn. Uh, you know, I'm really hoping to. Um, soon expand on the art that I'm doing and um, we're trying to get together like a, a gallery and stuff where you know it can be shown and maybe toured around and this is my masterpiece so far of uh, making a calico cat okay so technical and engineering challenges with these BCIs still um, wired connections it's that, that's something that is um, already getting phased out. There's, there's um, you know, a number of new um, devices that are wireless. Uh, but right now for things like stimulation, like, you know, I think you still need to be hooked up to some specialized equipment with wires. Um, Getting all of that equipment down into a, you know, a reasonable size box, um, especially if you want to consider it uh, to be portable, is an issue that's still being worked on. Um, the personnel that is needed to run these, well, like um, I have the tablet at home, and I can I can run that independently, um, which is a touchpad. Um, because everything's, you know, pretty simple. But if you were going to have a robotic arm somewhere, like attached to your chair or, or in your house, um, you know, it might be more complicated right now uh, than someone could do uh, independently. Uh, decoder retraining. Every day that I use the system I need to retrain a decoder because you know signals in your brain kind of shift and you know what I think was moving to the right one day might be you know down into the right the next day so then if you try to use that decoder from another day things are just um off they just they don't work they're not stable for for long-term use, uh, robot reliability. That's always my number one uh, disappointment with BCI is, you know, robots break and then, you know, it's it's uh, something that you, you couldn't deal with uh, on your own. If, if one of these systems was at your house or um, being used independently. There's also no, uh, that I know of current robot arms or, or um, 
devices like that that are even uh, developed that could work in a house like that KUKA is huge and you know it would just never work in my house and you know I could not use it you know attached to my chair to open doors when I'm going around or anything like that um hmm. so here's social media I got uh my email is BCI I can do better at gmail if you ever have any uh questions or you know want me to you know speak somewhere you can just shoot me an email I do have a collection of these videos on my YouTube under a playlist called My Cyborg Adventure. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, sorry for the crashes and then the, the now uh, rushing. But uh, yeah, thanks for you know sticking around and listening to me. Uh, ramble on just one of the things that I still want to get across is when I joined this study I knew it wasn't going to have direct benefits to me it's it's not designed to restore any of my function or sensation but I did it really to help push the science forward so you know future generations that have accidents like mine or, you know, illnesses that, you know, leave them feeling like they won't be able to accomplish anything or, you know, pursue the, the things they love to do, like, you know, games or, or painting or, or whatever that is. Um, I just want to help get that, uh, all that science moving forward so that those generations kind of don't have to go through that uh, period of, you know, despair or depression, and they can just kind of, you know, have some options. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathan. That was, that was amazing and highly enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, sorry uh, about the technical difficulties. No problem. So I'd like to bring Nima back on also. Oh, okay, here we are, here we are. All right, so I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, something that's come up several times in the question box is, you know, people are excited about these technologies. They wanna know when they will be more widely available. Um, and also they want you know it's it's interesting uh to hear from both of you and maybe what you think the largest roadblocks are to the technology being uh, disseminated and, and available maybe nemo if you want to start uh sure uh yeah i mean um uh, of course this question of uh, timing is the you know the million dollar question that we all uh, uh like to know um I can say, you know, the obstacles that are still uh, unresolved. Probably one of the biggest ones is to have, uh, uh, you know, to have uh, the ability to have these sort of devices, um, uh, being able to, you know, to, for chronic long-term implants without any uh, safety concerns, without any, uh, uh, you know, difficulty, and that is a very difficult problem to solve. And uh, you know. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic because now there are some uh, like commercial players are looking into this very actively. You know, this requires a team of uh, you know uh, mechanical engineers, you know, bio, uh, biomedical engineers, device uh, engineers, you know, biocompatible uh, sort of devices, uh, and um, to neurosurgeons, you know, to people who know how to safely implant these sort of devices. Uh, and you know this. I think the sensor part uh, is one of the biggest problems. That you know, if we have an integrated device that can be safely implanted, that would uh, you know give us sudden access to uh, the sort of signals that then can be then uh, used uh, for the sort of hearing devices that I talked about. We also have some engineering problems on the acoustic, on this just the sound processing part that um, need to be resolved. You know, for example, for the device that I mentioned. To be able to separate out the sources, all the sounds in the environment, in a noisy place, in a place that has a lot of uh, echo, uh, you know, when you have, like in a restaurant, you might have ten people talking at the same time, 
So to solve these algorithmically also, to be able to extract one of them out of, uh, out of all the, the, the mixed audio is a very difficult and challenging problem, which has seen great progress in the past few years. And that's also still something that has to be resolved. And finally, there are some scientific things that we have to address. Uh, for example, what happens if we put a person in a closed loop? Uh, you know, if they are unable to follow a speaker to begin with, how much signal, how much uh, you know, signature of the attention can be picked from the brain to amplify the source? And we are doing some research in that area and we see some very promising results. Like it seems like even if a talker is just 20%, 30% intelligible, uh, that seems to be enough for us to, to decode this uh, uh, you know, the focus of attention from the brain and then amplify the talker to help the person. Um, you know, and if, if you, if, uh, if, you know, I, I were to put a time on it, I would probably say, uh, I think in the next five years or so, uh, there would be some good progress. Nathan, do you have thoughts from the motor side? Um, yeah, so I, I would definitely agree with Nima on, uh, safety and durability of uh, these devices is, you know, uh, one of the big issues. Um, so when I started the study, it was actually for, uh, uh, it was a one year study. Uh, and then after the year, they submit stuff to the FDA and go, okay, it's still working. Let's, let's extend it. And then, you know, it got to five years and I hit the five year mark. And now now 10 years and I I wish I could say it works as well as it did in the first year, but um, signal quality, uh, you know, everyone knew it was gonna go down and it's just one of those things that, you know, no one knows how much and how fast and uh, I don't have actual like data cause I'm just the, the guinea pig, but you know, I'm sure they have a, you know, figures written down of, you know, how many percent it's gone down, but it's, it's definitely something that is noticeable and, but it is still working and I will use it until it, until it breaks, but it, it's one of those things that, um, for it to get out to more people at some point, someone has to say that it's it's good enough um and you know from my perspective of a user i think uh it's it's good enough depending on what what you want uh, want to do with it someone with even less uh function than me or like locked in uh someone that would really just enjoy to draw and play a simple game or, you know, browse the internet or something like that uh, on their own, um, you know, regardless of, you know, actually controlling a robotic arm or not, just, just that much alone that is possible independently now. I think for that person, it is good enough. Um, but it's one of those things like uh, no one knows how long these arrays are going to last. Uh, they have data from monkeys and, you know, monkeys do stuff like rub poop on their heads and bang their stuff around. So, you know, that I would expect that in humans it would last longer, but, uh, you know, there's stuff like infections that you can get and they will you know, cause this device to need removed. And yeah, it's just one of those things of someone saying it's good enough and it moving from this thing where you have to be around the right research uh, institute and have the right condition and, you know, the right life circumstances to be able to join a study like this. Um, you know, once it gets moved into that, area where you know insurance can get billed for it because people cannot afford this kind of stuff but um yeah so I, th I think it's coming um i don't know how soon but some of it is good enough some of it's not 
and it really depends on um, what you're trying to get out of it. What is it like for you as a participant to feel things going very slowly, given that you put so many hours of your own time into it, or or when things you know don't succeed in an experiment, or is it, for example? I mean, it's one of those things that it feels like everything is slow, but then I look back and it's been seven years since I, you know, got involved with the the team and all that, and uh, things have definitely changed and improved and. Like I knew when I joined the study, this I was at the very forefront. There was no one that had done it before me. So I knew uh, the things aren't going to always go right. And then, you know, I, I'm a very patient person and I don't get uh, upset easily. So when I'm at the lab and an experiment just doesn't work for, for whatever reason or equipment failure or, you know, they just the code has a you know mistyped thing somewhere and and they can't figure it figure it out i just sit there and watch youtube and listen and if i can add something to help i do but um it's one of those things that it's i see the progress and i realize it's it's been a while but also it's been the blink of an eye so Nima, i'd like to ask you what happens if you're in a situation where maybe the, the part of cortex that you want to work with is damaged like maybe the, the person had a stroke in the auditory cortex or speech processing area what can you do can you leverage plasticity in the brain and and sort of use territory from some other area to interface with? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It is a little bit outside of my area of expertise. Uh, but, but you know, the, as you mentioned, the research shows that uh, the brain has this remarkable uh, ability to rewire itself. So you know, if there is a part that is not being used by, uh, you know, what it was supposed to do, then it would be taken over by other senses to, you know, to, to be used for for other things, and you know, and that also is uh, something that um, we see with people, for example, who have stroke. Uh, you know, many of them may have uh, speech deficits following the the procedure, but then after a while, like after a year or two, uh, you know, uh, some of their um, you know speech uh, abilities is recovered just because the brain you know finds a way to rewire things or to use uh, you know some uh, redundancy. Um, uh, you know, to, to recover as much function as possible. Um, but, you know, for, for some things, like for example, if the auditory cortex, this type of signals that you're looking for, uh, for example, for to decode the attention of a person or the, to focus of the hearing, uh, that has to reach the cortex. Uh, so, so, you know, for somebody, for example, who is, you know, has a hearing loss at the lower level, for example, in the uh, auditory nerve or hearing, you know, hair cells, uh, then that requires alternative ways of uh, getting at this sort of question. Uh, something a bit related to that. Uh, someone had an interesting idea in the questions. Can you filter your auditory signals for emotion or sentiment instead of for intended speaker? Do you have, if they say that, uh, you know, maybe when anger sentiment is detected, you could take some action, like mute those sounds. They propose that could be a, a good tool for training nonviolent communication. Oh, uh, well, that is a very interesting idea. Uh, you know, what I say that uh, is that definitely the emotion can be detected from the brain. Like if you're looking at, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the activity in the auditory cortex, because, uh, you know, the emotions uh, in, in speech and, um, you know, in, you know, overall in audio, there are a lot of similarities also with music. Um, a lot of the ways that we, we convey emotions are by using acoustic cues, um, right? For example, if you're happy, we speak fast. If we are sad, we speak slowly and we drop our pitch. So that information is certainly is in the brain. It can be detected. Um, in terms of what to do with it, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a different different question that, um, um, uh, 
but you know, but I can say that it can be detected and an action can be taken based on that. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Jeff, you Nathan, what future capabilities are you now hoping for now that you have achieved Final Fantasy? <laughs> um, well, since I, I wasn't very good, I, I would hope that maybe one day, day I'll, um, I'll, I'll try again. Uh, really, if, if I could have anything I wanted right now, I would, I would definitely go. Uh, wireless bilateral implants and uh you know a ps5 or a new xbox and or a new computer that doesn't crash all the time and just really uh attempt to play any game i could um i enjoy doing things just because they haven't been done and it's possible so um lots of games I would I would try. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's all the time we have. So thanks to everyone in the audience for their attendance. Thanks to Nima and Nathan for joining us. Uh, if you're in the audience, please take two minutes to fill out the survey that we will put in the chat and let us know what you thought about the event. And we appreciate all feedback that you have for us. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Nima. And, and thank you, Nathan, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you for those of you that stuck with us and until the end. And we hope um, you will join us on Wednesday, February 22nd for our next event in the series where Dr. Nikos Krigas Korte and Dr. Um, Amanda <coughs> Ping Bodhi Baki will discuss the science around visual and sensory perception. Again, I hope you continue to stay healthy and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Good night.